It's the last, I would say, collective session of the day. So uh, now we have one hour and five to 15 minutes together to hear from all the authors of Wiki Workshop about the amazing work they have been doing. I'm so happy that we managed to get um, 13 papers accepted for this workshop and some of them will be in form of or longer oral presentation, uh, three of them and then one, nine of them, they're going to be enlightened talks. One unfortunately uh, couldn't make it today. Um, so um, with the, I, I want to just introduce the contributed talks with huge thanks to all authors for many things, for their work, for uh, coping up with us in all the changes that we have gone through due to the, this uh, you know, exceptional circumstances, with the amount of emails I've sent you, uh, and with basically all the dry runs we did together. So we are ready to go. Another huge thanks and big heart to uh, the PC members and the reviewers uh, who have done a fantastic work to select very high quality content for this workshop. And with these huge thanks, I think we can uh, start with the contributed talk. So Vladimir is going to talk about what's popular in Wikipedia what's trending in Wikipedia, capturing trends and language biases across Wikipedia editions. And if you can share your screen. Right, do you see it? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Great, all right. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Vladimir. I'm a PhD student at EPFL. Uh, I'll talk about trends and biases uh, in different language editions of Wikipedia. Uh, the importance of biases in Wikipedia has already been mentioned today multiple times, so I'm extremely excited to share our recent insights on this topic with you. The main goal of this work is to analyze the differences and uh, commonalities in readers' preferences across English, French, and Russian Wikipedia editions. Uh, to do that, uh, we detect trends using Wikipedia viewership statistics and analyze collective interests of the readers in those uh, languages. Just to give you a quick intuition of what we're going to do here, uh, I'll show you this teaser. Uh, after the presentation, you will have a chance to interact with this uh, visualization. Uh, here you see Wikipedia articles represented as dots. Uh, connection between them represent hyperlinks between articles. Uh, and as you can see, um, these are the pages related to the same topic, Miss America 2018. And if you look at the timeline in the bottom of the slide, uh, we can see that these articles are not very popular in the beginning of September, but on the 10th of September, when the show was broadcasted, a lot of people start actively exploring the cluster. And once the show is finished, this interest fades out. So this way, we detect events that interest Wikipedia readers uh, the most and use this approach to compare trends and language biases across editions. Now I'll tell you more about the technical side of the project. Uh, I'll start with the data set. We analyzed three Wikipedia language editions, uh, which is around 11 million pages connected with uh, 700 million hyperlinks. Uh, all data is anonymized, and we don't know location and click paths of the users. Uh, second, I'll introduce you the methods that we used. Uh, first, uh, we extracted subnetworks of trending Wikipedia articles. Then we extracted keywords from Wikipedia summaries of those articles. And after that, we have defined nine uh, high level topics based on the keywords. And finally, we have labeled uh, all the subnetworks with those topics. Now I'll briefly cover uh, every step in more detail. And I'll start with the subnetwork extraction. We use the fact that Wikipedia has associated structure. Uh, as we saw in the visualization in the beginning of the presentation, if readers are interested in the topic Miss America 2018, they will go and visit corresponding Wikipedia page. There, they will see links to related concepts. And since readers are interested in this topic, 
they will want to click on those links and explore them in more detail. This is the one, like, this is one of the main concepts of Wikipedia. If you formalize this concept, we can represent this, walk around this kind of graph, where nodes are Wikipedia pages and edges are hyperlinks between them. Uh, different users will have uh, different paths, but they will still visit the same pages related to this topic. Whenever they click on a page or a link in Wikipedia, their activity is recorded and stored as viewership statistics. Uh, to extract trending subnetworks, we use an algorithm that takes both network and viewership statistics and finds dynamic patterns in the network. So that if uh, two pages have similar level of activity in a given time frame, uh, it assumes that those pages are related and reinforces the connection between them. Once the subnetwork is extracted, uh, we use Leuven community detection algorithm to detect clusters of trending pages. When this is done uh, and we have extracted subnetworks, we need to define topics of the clusters of trending Wikipedia articles. We have used summaries of each page and extracted keywords. And based uh, on those keywords, we defined high level topics of each cluster. Uh, then we labeled a subset of clusters, uh, train the classifier based on this data and label the rest of the clusters in a semi-supervised fashion. As a result of all those previous steps, we get a label subnetwork, which looks pretty much like this. Uh, and now finally, like the most interesting part, let's compare the reader's preferences and see the results uh, of our work. So we analyzed three language editions of Wikipedia. Uh, note that these are not related to countries, locations, uh, because we don't have location data. Uh, we have defined nine most popular uh, topics that interest Wikipedia readers and based our analysis on those topics. And also note that we have split uh, sports and football in separate topics to avoid imbalanced classes uh, when training the classifier. So this is just a technicality. Uh, first, uh, we have focused on global statistics and got quite interesting insights. Uh, we can see that uh, English speaking readers are mostly interested in sports. Uh, French speaking audience prefers uh, content about movies and music. And Russian speaking readers are mostly focused on science, conflicts, politics, and religion. What is interesting is uh, note that topic religion is not trending among speaking uh, French speaking readers during this period that we have studied. Now let's see what kind of topics are common and what kind of topics are different across uh, three languages. We notice that uh, interest in global pop culture and traumatic uh, dramatic events like 9-11 and Stan Lee's death are common across languages. This spark interest among readers of all Wikipedia language editions that we have studied. However, this uh, are uh, many events that appear, th there are many events that appear only in one language. For example, local events related to natural disasters or local politics appear only in locally spoken languages. Uh, for example, Hurricane Michael appeared only in uh, English, uh, Quebec elections only in French, and Soyuz spacecraft related aerospace events appeared only in Russian. So why do the results look exactly like that? Uh, we have a few possible explanations. Uh, first, different media coverage. Uh, according to the study cited below, interests of 25 to 30% of Wikipedia readers are driven by news. Uh, we can also see a similar tendency in our study. Uh, second is cultural differences between Western and Eastern cultures. As shown in the same study, readers from Western and Eastern cultures have different motivations when coming to Wikipedia. Most of the readers coming from Eastern culture are driven by so-called intrinsic learning motivation. And this explains the domination, domination of the topic science among uh, Russian speaking readers, uh, which we see in our study. Finally, we can see that local events get more exposure in locally spoken languages. 
I would like to conclude saying that Wikipedia can tell us more than is written on its pages. And it's an interesting source of data that allows us to study cultural biases. In the future work, we would like to extend our study to more languages. As was suggested by one of the reviewers, uh, we have tested Wikidata as an additional source of information and turns out it simplifies topic detection pipeline, making it possible to easily extend the study to more languages. If you're interested in the results, visit the website of the project where you'll find latest research and data sets uh, from our group. And also uh, on the website, you'll find the interactive demo uh, that I promised in the beginning. Uh, thank you for listening. And now I'll be happy to answer all your questions. All right, Isaac, I, I'm seeing a few questions. I think we have time for one or two max. So yeah, please okay. keep it on time. We have yes. one, two minutes basically, I think. First one is, uh, I think, clarification question. Uh, oh, Lucy says I can skip that. The next one uh, coming from Rohan, um, he asks, what are the sizes of the subnetworks? Are they triangles or other structures? The sizes, uh, well, English uh, Wikipedia is the largest. Uh, Subnetworks are around uh, 5,000 nodes, more or less. And for um, Russian and French, they're about 1,000 pages. All right. Um, I actually have a question then. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, so you you described some of the reasons why some of these topics uh, spike in certain languages and not others. I'm curious if you were trying to surface certain topics as trending in other languages, whether there is specific uh, like types of topics that you think would be more pertinent to surface globally. Uh, well, actually, um, we're thinking about uh, studying only topics that are common across languages. So for this purpose, we wanted to, actually there was a contribution to our data set recently that allows us to study uh, lang links, uh, language links. So these are the links uh, between different languages on the same topics. So that will allow us to study uh, on the topics that are common across languages. So we haven't studied yet. Uh, we can only spot uh, manually right now, but if we change the data set, uh, it's totally possible. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. So the next, um, thank you very much. And thank you, Isaac, for handling the queue. We're having problems in letting people in the meeting. So I'm handling this situation in the meantime. So apologies. Uh, so the next uh, long talk is from Kai. Uh, and it will be about content growth and attention contagion in information network, addressing information poverty on Wikipedia. Um, Kai, if you are there, I know you are there, you can share your yeah. screen. Yeah, can you can hear me? Thank you so much. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Thank great, you. Great, great. Yes, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm uh, Kai Zhu from Boston University. So it's great to be here and talk about our study on content growth and uh, attention contagion on Wikipedia. Right. So this is work with my colleague, uh, Dylan Walker, and also uh, Lev Nuchnik. Uh, yeah, we, we all know Wikipedia, right? It, it's great. And every day, a huge amount of uh, information seekers end up getting information from Wikipedia. Uh, but however, uh, Wikipedia is not without problems. And in fact, we know that uh, it's subject to knowledge disparity uh, across both geographic area and also uh, knowledge domains. So Graham and Clauser, they have a study. They examine how geotech Wikipedia articles are distributed throughout the world. So they try to model and understand using different uh, explanatory variables, yet they still find that some part of the world uh, remain well below their expected values. And uh, uh, others have performed similar analysis across knowledge domain uh, from a similar problem. So this is problematic because it can lead to silo of knowledge and bias our perspective of uh, what is important, right? So the question is then, uh, why does this happen? Uh, what do we know? And more importantly, what can we do about it? 
So for the sake of time, I will uh, skip the literature and the relevant uh, work and jump directly to uh, what we do. So there are a lot of study research uh, focused on Wikipedia editors, right? Editors motivation and their entity and so on. But we take a different perspective. So in this study, we focus on the articles instead. So in a, a complex social technical system, system like Wikipedia, the articles are not, inter, are not independent. They are interconnected with each other via the hyperlinks. And for a given article, uh, we, uh, we would like to know how does attention uh, measured by something like a page views drive content production for that page? And vice versa, how more content may drive more attention attract to the article, like this feedback loop, whether it exists. And also, uh, moreover, does attention spill over onto other articles since it's all connected, uh, other articles in the Wikipedia networks. So, but the problem is, in a natural setting, all different faults come into play simultaneously, right? So the causal inference in this setting is challenged. To overcome this, we leverage a nature experiment, uh, which involving content contribution shock on Wikipedia, which is, the, the, so the nature experiment is, uh, there's Wiki, Wiki Education Foundation, they have conducted for uh, several years now, um, uh, they uh, work with college instructor so they can uh, create assignment for college students to create or expand a Wikipedia article as part of their class assignment. Right? A lot of articles actually have been expanded or created during the year and the scale of the campaign is very large. So this uh, gives us a chance to study uh, what's the impact of exogenous content contribution shock on Wikipedia. And particularly, we like, would like to focus on the contribution to, to the underdeveloped articles. So to infer the counterfactual of not receiving content contribution, we also construct a set of control articles that did not receive contribution from students and match them uh, with treaty articles based on article char characteristics. Okay, so what do we learn from this nature, nature experiment? So first, we find that there's significant lift in the post-shock page view for the treaty article uh, compared to article did not receive content contribution from students. So it's about 12% uh, lift on average compared to their own baseline page view before the shock. And the effect is, uh, I want to emphasize, is, is long lasting, right? At least didn't appear after 26 weeks after the content contribution shock. And we also find that uh, the effect is stronger if the article is less popular to begin with, also uh, when the article receives more content contribution during the, uh, during the class time. So which uh, can be at the highest 30 percentage lift. And not only page views, uh, when we look at in terms of editing uh, activity, also treaty article receive more edits and al also uh, more unique edit uh, in the six month period after the content uh, contribution shock. So an initial question following these results, uh, like where does this attention come from, right? So thanks to the release of Wikipedia uh, clickstream data, we can compare the traffic source uh, for both treaty article and control article. So what we found is that uh, it's really the increased traffic come from both internal links and external website. The internal traffic uh, is explained by more incoming link, right? We found there's more incoming link from other article uh, point to the article being, uh, being edited by the students. So that, that bring more traffic. And also external traffic is probably uh, explained by search engine visibility. So that's about the source of traffic. Then uh, what about spills of attention, right? Since the article are connected. So there's something, this is something we're really interested in. So the key finding here is that the creation of new link is very impactful. So when edit, edit article during the shock period, we can also add hyperlink on the page, point to other articles, right? Beyond just add a textual content. So students uh, didn't do it enough, but when they do, those new links can serve to open the floodgate of attention, right? Now the attention can spill over. And both model free evidence and the model estimate reveal that uh, this has a very substantial effect. Actually, it's 
as much as uh, uh, like receive directly content contribution. So this attention spillover phenomenon really caught us our uh, caught our interest. So we begin to wonder, can we create a policy right to leverage this effect to benefit information impoverished region in the network? Just, just to imagine two hypothetical policy. Right? In the first one, editor were encouraged to focus their effort on highly related groups of articles. And not only that, they deliberately also build up the network structure, like link structure around those articles while they are adding in textual content. And we term this uh, our proposed policy attention condition policy. And in the second one, editor focus their attention on article without considering the relativities of network structure. So this is our baseline policy to compare with, and we call it undirect attention policy, right? And the question is, um, which policy is better, right? And also how much better? So the mean field estimation uh, will give us some intuition, but I'll skip uh, and direct, go directly into the, our main uh, results, which is uh, the empirically informed page rank diffusion simulation. So I believe a lot of us are familiar with page rank algorithm. And the cool thing about our simulation is that we make diffusion follow empirical data on actual surfing behavior. And again, thanks to the click stream data, the actual surfing behavior is known from those click stream patterns. Okay, so here uh, is a graphic depiction of the two policy we are comparing. Um, so there's a lot of subtle detail about how we select the proxy for in published region, how we match sub network for the two policy, and also how we do the perturbation. But uh, I jump to the result for, for the sake of time. Uh, indeed, we find the attention contagion policy needed to significantly can increase in excess attention to the impoverished region, which is up to two, twofold on average. And here, uh, excess attention is defined by the uh, percentage difference in page rank number for article in the perturbed set. And the result hold, holds both for uh, community and also clicks in the network. Uh, you, as you can see, the blue uh, color represents attention contagion policy because it's spread out to higher region of the uh, value. Uh, so it's on average higher than uh, compared to undirect attention policy, which cluster in uh, the value cluster in lower ranging, uh, lower region. Yeah, so, th so uh, yeah, so this is a takeaway, right? Uh, editorial effort uh, does lead to significant and long lasting impact and the attention uh, propagate over the information network through hyperlinks. And finally, uh, informational inequality can be alleviated using policy that best leverage attention spill. So this is our study. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Kai. I'll jump in, Miriam is helping debugging some of the meeting issues we have. Um, thanks for your talk. We have 30 mm -hmm. seconds maybe for a quick question, Isaac, if there's a question from audience. Yep, um, from Neil, and this refers to some of those earlier graphs on the page view effects. Um, why did the control articles also see increased page views after the shock? Right, right. So uh, part of it is because of seasonality, right? Because we, what we found is that during the semester, like a, a school semester, the Wikipedia article have higher, uh, a lot of Wikipedia have higher viewership. So that's the exact reason why we need to have a control group, right? It's a, it's a, you know, the fluctuation on Wikipedia is a difficult to control. So it's better to compare the treated with control. So, uh, yeah, and that's just what we found. There's one more from Benjamin, if we have a quick moment. Did you look at the size of the edits that occur post shock as well as the number? Mm hmm So I, I didn't get it. Did you look at the size in terms of characters added or changed in the edits that occur post shock? The edits. The, oh, you mean the how much content being added to the? So, yeah, uh, we didn't. We look at number of edits, but didn't really look at the size. But we, I could check that. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, Isaac. Sorry, um, I I cut you. Is that is that all from 
the question front. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kai. I thank think you, you can uh, stop sharing your screen and we give the floor to Nick Nicholas Vincent, um, who's going to talk about a deeper investigation on the importance of Wikipedia links to the success of search engines. Sweet, yeah. Can everyone uh, hear my voice and see my screen? Yes, thanks. Awesome. All right, I will go ahead and get started. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Nick. I'm a PhD student at Northwestern in the People, Space and Algorithms Research Group. And I'm excited to present work I did with my advisor, Brent Hecht, looking at the importance of Wikipedia links to search engines. So I will jump right in. So I wanna start with the underlying motivation for the work. There's all this huge research interest and economic interest in intelligent technologies and researchers, including folks here, um, have highlighted many benefits of intelligent technologies um, in terms of things like saving money, providing better services to people, helping peer production. On the other hand, the research community has also identified downsides like privacy concerns and exacerbated economic inequality. And these discussions often focus on algorithms and platforms, but another critical component is data labor, the activities that people take to create data that fuels intelligent technologies. And I think this has been alluded to in several presentations today already. Uh, so why study this? Well, the economic concerns are high stakes and um, Studying data labor is really about studying the sustainability of peer production because highly valuable data labor is performed by peer production communities. At a high level, by making people more aware of the value of this so-called data labor, it's more possible to leverage that value. Um, and leveraging the value in some cases could mean like getting a paycheck, but not in the case of Wikipedia. For Wikipedia, this might mean recognition, agency, or other forms of support. Okay, so how exactly do Wikipedia and search engines fit into this data labor research agenda? Uh, well, search engines are incredibly widely used and hugely influential, uh, Google's a verb, and search engines are relying on training data, clicks, and the actual results that they serve to users. And a lot of research has looked at the relationship between them. So in 2017, McMahon and all performed a browser extension experiment and found removing Wikipedia links from Google search results uh, hugely dropped the click-through rate, a really important metric. And I should point out that this study was actually motivated by a call from the Wikimedia Foundation, I think at the Wiki workshop, maybe uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong about that, and so people have been aware of this for a really long time. Uh, and then in a follow-up study that I led, we actually collected a bunch of search engine results pages with, with scraping software, um, or SERPs as they're called. And we found that Wikipedia was extremely prevalent um, in the SERPs that we collected with some caveats. Uh, so the takeaway is that Wikipedia is one of the most important uh, search sources of results for search engines. So we had some further questions. Uh, what about search engines other than Google? All of the research so far is focused on Google with good reason. Um, and also what about mobile results? So if people are increasingly using mobile devices. Um, and we ran into a technical challenge. How do we handle the fact that these SERPs, search engine results pages are, are really kind of changing all the time and they look different for different search engines and they're not any, they're not 10 blue links anymore. Um, so there's all sorts of things in SERPs, such as the, the knowledge panel or the knowledge box, uh, which you'll see on the right-hand side of a lot of SERPs, the news carousel, the Twitter carousel, et cetera. And these are all really important. All right, I'm going to dive right into the methods. What do we actually do? Um, well, we needed to pick some search engines, some devices, and some queries to investigate. So in this study, we focused on Google, Bing, and DuckDuckGo. And we considered both desktop and mobile devices. And we actually also considered the effect of different screen sizes. I'll talk about that towards the end. And the question of what queries to make is really the most critical and challenging. Um, it's very tough. There's no you know, open data source of search queries that Google publishes or anything. So our approach was to identify multiple important categories and draw on past work. And going really quickly through them, basically there's three categories. There's common queries, which we took from a search engine optimizations company that estimates the volume, query volume. So these are things like Facebook, YouTube, Amazon. We got trending queries from Google Trends, things like World Cup or Thank You Next. And then finally, medical queries from prior research that uh, use Bing data. There's things like how to lose weight or indigestion. Okay, so our approach for data collection, we use Puppeteer, which is a Node.js software to run headless Chrome or uh, basically a web browser. You don't actually need to have a screen. You can run it on a server. And we forked uh, the SE Scraper library and our version focused on recording and analyzing link coordinates within the space of a SERP. I'll talk more about that later. And I'll also put, repost all the code links on the final slide and paste them into chat as well if you want to check it out. Um, so the old approach for SERP scraping is the researcher might look at the HTML, uh, maybe something like this, and write a bunch of CSS rules and say, okay, I'm going to find all the elements with the class of search results, ABC123, and get a ranked list. Um, okay, but what do I do if my search page looks like this, as a lot of them do nowadays, or uh, zooming in a little bit like this, there's tons of stuff there that's not obviously parsable into a ranked list. 
So our approach is just, let's just get all the links in the page, all the A elements, and basically calculate their positions, their coordinate, their X, Y coordinates and pixels within the page uh, using JavaScript. Um, and then you can basically have a page like this. Maybe I search for Zoom. You can look at the full page and define a full page incidence rate. You could draw a line and say, okay, how many times is Wikipedia appearing above the folder? How often? How about um, in the left-hand side of the page or the right-hand side of the page? You can basically keep drawing rectangles and define these different spatial incidence rates to calculate how often a domain, Wikipedia in this case, is appearing within a SERP or a collection of SERPs. So we looked at the full page instance rate. We also looked at things like above the fold, the area above um, where you basically where you don't have to scroll, the top of the page. I called above the fold reference to newspapers. Uh, the data validation for this data is, is actually pretty tough. SERP data changes all the time. And you might remember recently Google changed their whole SERP and then had to roll it back because there was all this backlash. Um, so how do we check that our data is actually good? Uh, the basic approach, just really going quickly through it, is that we take a screenshot of every SERP we collect, and then you can visualize your analysis-ready data. So like the JSON file that I'm actually doing quantitative analysis with, I make a, a visualization of it, and I make sure that the screenshot matches up with the, the quantitative data. Uh, so give, to give you a really brief idea what it looks like on the right-hand side, this messy stuff is, a, is the quantitative data. It's every single link on a SERP, kind of visualized with, with some colors and on a, a matplotlib grid. I mean, on the left, is the screenshot of that SERP. And I can actually just come in here as the researcher. I did this for a, a big sample of my data and say, okay, on the right, on the right hand side, there's a Wikipedia link. I highlighted them in green. Um, that might not be super easy to see, but I basically make sure, okay, does that Wikipedia link actually appear on the screenshot of the SERP? And in this case, they do this data was good. It wasn't corrupt. We actually found a lot of errors this way. And I had to rerun my results quite a few times uh, because of errors with the SERP collection. All right, diving into results. Um, so we looked at these incidence rates. How often is Wikipedia showing up when we queried for a bunch of different queries, a bunch of different devices, and a bunch of different search engines? Looking at the full page incidence rates, that's the left half of this picture, we saw that Wikipedia links were present in many, uh, 70 to 80% in some cases, of common and trending SERPs, but much less in medical SERPs. Um, and only DuckDuckGo really is using Wikipedia for a high percentage of the medical queries that we made. Uh, comparing desktop to mobile, we saw generally similar results. The full page incidence rates were quite similar for the mobile device as to de desktop devices. Uh, next, looking at the above the fold incidence rates, the top no scroll required part of the SERP, we saw the desktop results are still very similar. In other words, when Wikipedia links appear, they appear at the top of the page often. On mobile, however, that's not true. Not too surprising given that above the fold is a much smaller amount of screen size on a mobile device. And I'll note that we accounted for different screen sizes here by calculating these results with different uh, above the fold lines that correspond to different devices. And we found qualitatively similar results. So shown here is just the, the middle ground estimates. We kind of did a lower bound, middle ground, upper bound approach there. Finally, now looking at this left hand versus right hand dichotomy, we saw that for the common and trending queries, the right hand incidence rate was around the same or higher than the left hand incidence rate. So this suggests that Wikipedia's prevalence in SERP results is coming on the right-hand side of the page from those knowledge panel style elements that you might be familiar with, but they're not the only source. There's the other sort, there's actual, there's blue links, not just knowledge panel links to Wikipedia. Okay, so to summarize those findings that I went through very quickly, uh, using this easy to understand, but, but limited measure of instance rates, it seems that Wikipedia's importance to the success of search engines extends beyond Google and beyond desktop formatted search results. So this is a big replication uh, uh, an extension of, of prior work that's looked at this relationship. And queries and devices matter a lot. So there's differences in terms of medical devices. There's the fact that if you're on a mobile device, you won't see Wikipedia on the top of your screen, but on a desktop device, you probably will. And then there's also these things like knowledge panel elements, which will definitely uh, control or have an effect on, on how users are basically seeing these Wikipedia links. Uh, so a couple discussion points. This definitely reinforces the idea that data from the public is fueling these highly profitable and influential intelligent technologies and raises the question, are Wikipedia editors some of the most important employees of search engines? And uh, what would we do about this? It's complicated, as I'm sure this group is, is hyper, hyper aware. Um, you cannot pay people to edit Wikipedia, certainly. And there's also complications around funding relationships. So what should search engines do? Should they more prominently credit Wikipedia, credit individual contributors, solicit contributions? Uh, I'm sure there's a, a ton of, maybe we can discuss this in the poster session. I'm sure folks here would have tons of ideas around this. Finally, this reinforces that Wikipedia matters outside Wikipedia. On the positive side, that means anything, any research you do to help uh, improve uh, biases in Wikipedia will basically affect the users of search engines, which is almost everybody using uh, the internet. On the other hand, negative things like uncovering biases or having uh, problems, any problems will basically uh, propagate through search engines. 
this really raises the stakes of the research. Uh, some big limitations, this is a small scale audit study. We don't have Google's actual data. This is still US and EN only. Uh, that's a huge limitation as people have talked about a ton. There's a lot of geographic and language differences. If anyone wants to try to do extensions across these, uh, I would be interested in hearing or collaborating. And the queries matter immensely. Okay, really quickly, I wanna say a big thanks to my co-author, the reviewers, uh, tons of open software that this relied on. Finally, I just wanna uh, highlight the uh, Community Data Science Collective's uh, COVID-19 Digital Observatory. This is a project uh, to collect uh, uh, data for COVID-related uh, uh, things, and there's SERP data for COVID-related keywords using a newer version of this uh, data collection software that I developed after I did the study, and so this might be of interest to you. Um, and finally, here's some links in case you wanna check it out or communicate with me, and that is uh, 10 minutes and 15 seconds. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nick, uh, for staying in time, on time. Um, Isaac, uh, is there anything from the chat, from questions? Um, there's none from the chat. I have a quick question if we have time now. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh -oh. um, so the, the question I have for, for you, Nick, um, is around the medical uh, queries. I'd be curious as to your interpretation. So that was where we saw a big difference between DuckDuckGo and, and Bing and Google in the Wikipedia incidence rate. Um, is that due to, do you think, kind of differences in their algorithm or kind of more explicit design choices that they've made? Uh, my opinion is that, and I, I don't have like any causal evidence for this in my data. My opinion is that there is an ex something explicit going on with the design choice. The evidence of this is that Google and Bing both have a special knowledge panel, or it appears to me that there's a special knowledge panel for medical queries. I don't know what they're doing technically to distinguish a medical query from other queries, but um, the knowledge panel looks different and it only has links in it from a certain set of sources. So it's like Mayo Clinic, um, WHO, maybe some doc of resources, stuff like that. So I think that's what it is. Thanks. There's some really interesting differences in the COVID data too, where um, Bing was serving tons of Wikipedia queries and, and Google actually was serving none for a brief period after they got a bunch of flack for pushing this information. And um, yeah, I, I don't have the answers to that. If, if folks wanna dive into that, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, all right, thank you so much, Nick. So that would be the end of our uh, session of uh, long talks. Thank you so much for the three of you for uh, taking the time of sharing your fantastic work. We are having a problem that is that people who left the meeting and want to come back cannot access this meeting and they're all in a parallel meeting that I don't know why this is happening. I am not a Zoom professionist, uh, a professional. So um, the problem is one of the speakers of the lighting talks is in that uh, other room. So I can present on her behalf, uh, but we're trying to fix the problem in the meantime, because also after this, we are going to split in individual meetings and we should be back in this main room for a social event. And so it would be great uh, yeah, yeah, I tried, Laura, thank you. I tried to invite them and they are, yes, they're having another wiki workshop without us. So uh, basically uh, we are trying to, uh, uh, okay. Uh, they are trying to solve it while I'm going through the lighting talks, right, Leila? That is correct, yeah, go, go ahead. Please. I'll go ahead. There is no point of all of us to change the meeting link right now. Okay. Um, we cre creating a new event for everyone. Thank you uh, everyone for your, your technical support. So we thought about this and actually it would be basically the same link, but maybe not, I don't know, this, this would be probably a little bit too disruptive if 97 people need to change meeting right now. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, and there's a chance that we may not come back to this one, so let's not risk it with that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so be patient. Uh, I uh, need, okay, that's fine. I, I'm going to share the PDF with all the lighting talks. Give me one minute just to message the last lighting talk that uh, I will present on her behalf because she cannot access for the moment. So just one minute and I will be sharing. And Pablo, you're the first, so get ready. Yeah.
All right, uh, ready. So let me share this. Do you see your slides? Yes. Good. Uh, this uh, Mac stuff. Let me see you. Full screen mode. Very slowly, this should work. Okay, uh, Pablo uh, and all of you, there are nine presentations here. You have three minutes each. Uh, so please try to be on time. Uh, we are a bit flexible with timings, but, but please be on time. And uh, Pablo, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks Mir. Um, hi everyone, my name is Pablo Etia and I am a doctoral researcher at Humboldt University of Berlin. And the topic of my article is the geographical bias of information covered by Wikipedia. Up to date, this bias has been studied only analyzing the number of articles associated with places, but that approach is not considering the weight or centrality of the articles. So I would like to propose a different approach sensitive to these differences between articles. Could you change the slide, please? Does that work? Yeah. Yes. No, it, it doesn't work. Um, Sorry. <laughs> that's interesting. You cannot uh, see that. Oh, resume share. There is something very wrong happening here. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. Take your time. Why is sharing is paused? Okay, let me try to do this again. Sorry, it went too well up to now, right? I mean, when you're handling a remote conference with more than a hundred people, something must go wrong. But luckily, we survived until now. So now you can see that, right? Right. <laughs> and this is your third slide. So I'm going to yes. go to the second. Sorry, Pablo, to interrupt yes. your beautiful presentation. Okay, right. thanks. Okay, my proposal is to consider at the same time two aspects. On the one hand, the number of articles linked to places, which is the traditional indicator of ge geographical bias. But on the second hand, what I call the positioning of the articles, that is the internal weight that they have within this information system. Inside this second factor, I propose to include two components. First, the exposure of articles in multiple languages and second, their connectivity with other articles, observing the hyperlink network between them and then calculating centrality measures like the, the page rank. Um, so my proposal here is to summarize both components of the positioning in a single indicator of uh, the overall weight of each article in Wikipedia. And I am working with biographies for my PhD thesis, so I call this indicator the biographical centrality index. Um, could you change, Miriam, please? Okay, Did so, it work? yes, good. Thanks. To test the relevance of this new approach, I made an empirical study with biographies of people that are available in 25 or more languages in Wikipedia. Uh, and my question was how geographically biases is the biographical information about this? famous people. And when you put all the biographies on a map with each person birthplace as the geographical reference, you can see a really high concentration of information coverage. Um, just considering the number of biographies, there are just five countries, the USA, the UK, Italy, France, and Germany, sorry, um, that concentrate all the information. Yeah. Uh, sorry, that concentrate 50% uh, of the information. And this generates a Gini coefficient of 0.79, which indicates a very high inequality. Yeah, but this is the information provided by the traditional approach. And if we then weight the biographies by their positioning, summarized with the biographical centrality index, the results change significantly. Now, more than 62% of biographical coverage is concentrated in the same five countries and the inequality coefficient reaches 0.84. So to conclude, 
Uh, one relevant finding of this paper is that the positioning seems to increase uh, the estimation of inequality. And um, if that's correct, previous evaluations may have underestimated the geographical bias of information in Wikipedia. And finally, I would like to emphasize that this methodology would be replicable without big changes for the estimation of other biases, uh, for example, the gender bias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. And next is uh, Jessica, if you're around. Probably, Hello. yes, great. Uh, Jessica, the floor is yours, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jessica Herrera. I'm a PhD student of social complexity sciences at the Universidad del Desarrollo, that's in Chile. And I'm delighted to present my work here on collaboration patterns of performing artists. Uh, collaborations in performing arts make possible the creation of new artworks. Studying these collaborations contributes to understand one behavior that may be unique to humans, the making of art. This area has received little attention because performing arts are very difficult to track. Hence, we propose the use of historical records to investigate the most relevant artworks created by performing artists. We selected um, only ballet and opera because they have the most consistent encyclopedic records. In our project, we reconstruct the network of artists that collaborated in the production of new ballet and opera uh, with data obtained from a Wikidata query service, shown here. But we also used a real-world network obtained from the historical repertoire of the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, the PBT, a ballet company in the United States. My presentation today focuses on the general descriptions of the network structure of ballet and opera, yet our project also includes a comparison of collaboration patterns and community detection. Um, the networks displayed on the next slide, please. Um, next slide, thank you. Are static with no specific time window. In our analysis, uh, a node represents an artist and a link represents the collaborations between artists for the same artistic work. On this slide, you can see the network composition by artist types in different colors. We see that networks reconstructed from Wikidata resemble the composition seen in the real world. For instance, the making of opera consists mainly of collaborations between composers and librettists, while ballet requires more artist types, such as choreographers and costume designers. The, PBT, uh, the network of the PBT showed a more even composition. So this network represents individual working together to set performances on a stage and not only creating new works as those from Wikidata. In the table, at the top of the slide, you can see some of the metrics obtained from each network. The Wikidata networks, those labeled as ballet and opera, showed a larger number of isolated components, but this was not observed in the PVT network. This may be only an artifact of the Wikidata coverage with more profiles but missing collaborations. This feature of the Wikidata reduces our chances to make more detailed network analysis. Yet we believe that the research is a good starting point to overcome the challenge of analyzing collaborative behaviors in the context of performing arts. Thank you for listening and I am happy to answer to your questions. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, all, the, all the lighting talks and the oral longer presentation, uh, the authors will be present in the post session after this one. So please keep your questions for later. Uh, yeah. Up is uh, Zhang. Are you around? We did yes, your. I'm, I'm ready. Yes, good. Fiori is yours. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. I'm Trai Zhang from Beijing Normal University. And it is a great honor to attend this workshop and give a presentation about our paper domain-specific automatic scholar profiling based on Wikipedia. In this study, a framework for automatic scholar profiling is constructed to help junior researchers have a systematic understanding of basic knowledge in a specific domain, which includes two major phases, fine-grained entity typing and keyword extraction. Uh, the, the, next, the next slide, please. Hmm. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, personal record, personal research record is considered as a kind of basic information for renowned scientists and, he, uh, and junior scholars are facilitated to use relevant information as guidelines to conduct further studies. To extract such information, existing NER methods usually utilize structured information like Infobox in Wikipedia to generate labeled training datasets. However, it may lead to severe mislabeling problems because once a term appears as the corresponding value of an attribute in the Infobox, it will be labeled as the it will be labeled as the attribute wherever it appears in the article. As we can see from the example, University of Paris appears as the alma mater of Mrs. Curie. So sentences like she was also the first woman to become a professor at the University of Paris will be labeled as her alma mater, but it is actually her working institution. So uh, to address this problem, we propose an embedding method named TransP to represent entities and the relations between them into low dimensional vectors for further typing. A series of experiments show that typing performance is largely improved using TransP against other embedding methods. Uh, meanwhile, uh, selective bibliographies in Wikipedia often covers a large amount of academic concepts, which are helpful for junior researchers to know what has been achieved in one domain. Thus, a keyword extraction method is needed. Existing supervised methods, usually based on a binary classifier, which means that phrases are classified into keywords or non-keywords, and fails to provide the rel relative importance of concepts to junior scholars. To address this problem, a new keyword extraction method based on learning to rank at Adaboost is proposed. It extracts keywords by ranking candidates according to their possibilities of being selected as keywords. Categories of experiments show that the proposed method outperforms other keyword extraction methods on two data sets. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Yang. Um, next up is uh, Chen Chen from Yahoo Research. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, please. Uh, oh, good to go, okay. Hi, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Chen Chun Li from Yahoo Research. Today, I'm going to introduce the topic layer graph embedding for entity recommendation using Wikipedia in a Yahoo Knowledge Graph. This is a joint work with uh, Kim San Liu from Stony Brook and uh, Nicholas Tozak, also from uh, Yahoo Research. First, uh, let me tell you what is Yahoo Knowledge Graph. When you search for something on Yahoo, uh, for example, like uh, Brad Pitt, uh, you will no notice that there will be a knowledge panel at the right-hand side of the search result page which includes the search entities information. This information is all powered by Yahoo Knowledge Graph. Um, today, we are especially uh, focused on the red square people also search for part, which give you the related entity recommendations for the entity you query. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, so our recommendation system is based on the proposed uh, layer graph embedding in a nutshell, it means to construct embedding by bias random walks and on separated uh, subgraph as layers. To generate the embedding, uh, we consider three different kinds of a graph. The first is a wiki link graph, uh, which is a hyperlink mentioned on the Wikipedia page, and uh, we take the top 10 languages in Wikipedia to build a link graph. The second graph is similar to the first one, uh, except that we only take links in the main text part, and the number of the appearance of the links is also considered. The third one is the click stream graph, which is also provided by Wikipedia that consists of the number of a link clicked by user. We treated uh, each of the graph as a layer to construct our embedding. And the embedding is a great, because the embedding is a great proxy of the entity similarity. So we take, just take the uh, K nearest neighbor as a candidate, and then we can just use the cosine similarity and other features like, like uh, page views for ranking to get a final recommendation result. Uh, next page. So let me show you some of our recommendation result. Uh, our method provides us a generic uh, uh, recommendation of uh, Wikipedia entities. Uh, with the pow uh, proper help of entity type, we can do recommendations like uh, doing uh, people to people, uh, people to company, or general entity query. Also, uh, since our embedding are trained with a different language, we can also ask recommendations for different language like a, a query for Chinese or for a query for France, etc. 
uh, this recommendation system is almost 100% uh, powered by Wikipedia, except that uh, in production, we also include the Yahoo search log of co-occurrence to customize it a little bit, but the result is mostly uh, on par. Uh, lastly, the graph data set, uh, data set and the training golden set will be public available on Yahoo Web Scope soon. And uh, thanks to everyone. And if you are interested, uh, the discussion session will be uh, modeling and embedding. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. So here we have a presentation from one of the presenters who's unfortunately is, is locked out in the other room. Uh, you will find her in the process session. I think Diego is around to uh, t tell you a little bit about the work. I am so sorry for Katrina. We're doing everything we can to, to solve this problem. But luckily we have for interactive process session so you can ask anything you want to her. Diego, are you there? Uh, yeah, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, thank you so much for covering for her, thank you. Yeah, no, no, this is a, this is a pity. This was first uh, presentation for Katarina in a conference, but for sure in the uh, poster session, you can ask her more questions. So this was a work that was Katarina's uh, master thesis and uh, was about matching Ukrainian red links with English Wikipedia articles. So, and the idea here is to, uh, please, can you pass to the next slide, Miriam, please. So the main idea here is that um, we want to take uh, red links on the Ukrainian Wikipedia, and then we can generalize this to other wikis, but this is a use case with the Ukrainian Wikipedia, the take red links and try to match to English Wikipedia. So this problem can also be generalized as taking any red link in any Wikipedia and match with a Wikidata item and then use this for, for example, translation or for pointing to the red link in the, to, to the link in uh, an existing article in another wiki. So uh, Karina's work was basically in trying different strategies for doing this kind of matching and um, we are also contributing with a, a data set of uh, red links uh, in the Ukrainian Wikipedia that match to English Wikipedia. So there was a manual correction work there. And you can see on the paper on uh, the link to the data sets and also the link to the, to the code of this. But um, basically uh, the main strategies that we tried, uh, Miriam, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, consist in using, uh, uh, BabelNet as a, as a baseline. So basically we were taking the word in um, BabelNet and try to see which, uh, which uh, entities it detects in other Wikipedias. And then we also tried a graph approach using uh, the links uh, that are surrounding the red links and comparing with uh, the ones in English. And we also tried something, uh, something more uh, Easy that was uh, working with the Levinstein distance or edit distance, basically transliterating because uh, the Ukrainian is written in Syriac, but we transliterate this to Latin and then to compare uh, the and then we compare the 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 edit distance between the links on Wikipedia and, and uh, sorry and in English or in Ukrainian. We also tried with uh, multilingual word embeddings, uh, and uh, surprisingly, uh, this uh, the, the the best result we would we got with the Levinstein distance. So basically, that's uh, mainly because most of the red links on the Ukrainian Wikipedia that we found were uh, nouns, so proper nouns or on uh, places. So in that case, the Levinstein distance works uh, the best. But uh, for sure, the combination of all these models uh, worked better. So you can uh, talk more in details about experiments with uh, with uh, Katarina. You also have uh, in this uh, in slide the link to get the data set. Uh, we think what one of the main contribution of this work is uh, the data set that we are sharing here. So you can apply your own techniques for uh, aligning uh, red links uh, with existing articles in Wikipedia. Thank you very much, and please uh, talk with Katerina during the poster session later. Thank you, thank you, Diego, for covering uh, for Katrina. There might be a chance that we can get the two students who were left out from this this call 
to present in the in the final fun session just because they deserve uh, some visibility and to present to a broader audience but let's see so i've spoken enough today i think uh, tiziano you're next to talk about a yeah. wiki text yes okay hi everyone i'm tiziano piccardi phd student in uh, the data science lab at uh, epfl and I'm going to present you uh, wikihist.html uh, that is a data set of the full history of English Wikipedia in uh, HTML. There are uh, many reasons that motivate this project, uh, but since we have only three minutes, I want to focus on one question. Can we rely on the wiki text uh, to get uh, uh, the links on a Wikipedia page? This is an important question because uh, many research projects uh, rely on the links uh, uh, network. Uh, to study, for example, the evolution of Wikipedia navigability or to use the network property to train other downstream models. Unfortunately, the answer for, to that question is no. Because as you know, uh, Wikipedia is written in uh, uh, Wikitext and converted by MediaWiki in HTML. Uh, in this example, uh, Niue uh, is an island country. Uh, you can see that uh, despite of uh, only the text island country, uh, is a, a wiki text link uh, encoded with a double uh, uh, square bracket. In the HTML, uh, we have two links. The additional one is, uh, uh, the, is marked in red in this case. Uh, it was created by a template. This is uh, caused by the flexibility of uh, MediaWiki that allows templates and external module to inject links in the HTML of the page. So for this reason, uh, we, and to have a full picture of uh, the um, Wikipedia links network, we converted the full history of uh, English uh, Wikipedia into HTML. Uh, we created uh, for, uh, to do this, a large uh, parallel architecture uh, that acted as a sort of uh, time machine uh, to render the HTML by using the exact uh, template version available at the time uh, the editor created uh, each uh, article revision. Um, so uh, what, did we, what did we discover uh, with the uh, HTML uh, dump? Um, by comparing the two data set, HTML and Wikitext, we found, uh, for example, that 7% or 1.3 million uh, uh, element, the, um, what you see in the red uh, square uh, of the transition uh, contained in the public uh, Wikipedia clickstream wouldn't be uh, possible if you look only at the link uh, network generated by Wikitext. Second, we also compare uh, um, how the average number of links in a page, on a page change in time, and we notice substantial differences. For example, the gap between uh, the two um, blue curves showed that in 2019, the HTML, um, the average number of links in a page uh, by looking at the HTML version is three times more uh, than uh, the links uh, you could get from uh, Wikitext. Uh, if everyone is interested, uh, we release uh, publicly this data set. It's a seven tera and uh, it's released on Internet Archive. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for your attention. If you have other question, I can uh, answer in the post session. Uh, great, thank you Tiziano and thank you Mark again. Uh, next up is uh, Wikigender, a machine learning model of sex gender on Wikipedia. Hello. So, yes, uh, Sophia, right? Yes. Yes, please, the floor is yours. So, hello. I'm Sophia, I'm a master's student at TPFL, and I'm here to present our project, Wikigender, a machine learning model to detect gender bias in Wikipedia. As you may know, Wikipedia is visited by more than 9 billion people per month, and its articles are edited by volunteers around the world, which means that sometimes subjectivity and bias are introduced. As uh, we, as many people during this conference, were interested in bias. In our case, the aim of this project is to find out if there is a difference in the way people describe men and women Wikipedia and identify which words are creating the difference. The bias is, is explored in two ways. 
First, we analyzed which topics are more likely to appear depending on gender. And then we also studied the bias in terms of the subjectivity introduced through the usage of adjectives. If you can please move the slides. Okay, so the dataset we use is the overviews of the Wikipedia biography articles. There's almost 1.5 million biographies, but almost 17% of them are about women. From the overuse, we build the vocabulary with the most common words, excluding stop words and using a neutral version of those that include gender. That way, each biography is represented with a bag of words, a binary vector which indicates the presence or absence of the words of the text. Then we balance the data set. There is a wide variety of occupations and many of the words in the overviews were related to them. So to cope with it, we balance the data set by occupation, keeping the same number of entries for each gender. Then the model takes us input the content overview and uses logistic regression to assign the probability that it belongs to a woman. An accuracy score higher than 50% in the task of gender prediction will reveal the presence of the bias. Moreover, the uses of this simple model allow us to detect which fixtures, in our case words, are more associated with each gender. And here are the results. Uh, the model achieves an accuracy of 54.6% by using only adjectives. To get a better understanding, we extracted the most predictive adjectives for each gender. Using the subjectivity lexicon, we discovered that women tend to be described with more positive and strongly subjective adjectives, while men are described with more negative and weakly subjective adjectives. When including the nouns, we got an even higher score. Again, we extracted the most predictive words and used the empath library to check the topics related to its gender. Results show that overviews of women are related to family, whereas the one portraying men are mostly related to business and sports. If you are interested about this project, you can join us in the poster session under the topic Knowledge Gaps and Content Reuse. Feel free to visit our site by scanning the QR code. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sophia. And next one, I think it will be Aiko. Yeah, so Aiko, the first author of this paper, is one of the two students who's locked out of this meeting. So we will try to recover for that. But in the meantime, I can try to substitute her, although it's uh, not possible because she is fantastic. Uh, but I'll try to do my best. So um, Aiko did an internship with. Uh, uh, Outreachy with us, um, with uh, Guillerme, Sam, and myself, uh, uh, the last quarter, so a few months ago. And the aim of the internship was to essentially productionize a machine learning model that we developed at the Wikimedia Foundation some time ago. That, given a sentence, can um, in Wikipedia can automatically detect whether the sentence would need a citation or not. And so. Um, Basically, she designed this whole system that uh, automatically scans through a large set of random articles, extracts all sentences, and then run the citation need model that will then um, expose and surface those sentences in this big chunk of articles that will need um, citations. And so this is then deployed in a data dump that is available on uh, the WMF uh, the Toolforge, the Toolforge, um, it's, it's a Toolforge database, um, and it's uh, publicly publicly accessible. And the dumps resulting from uh, this citation detective tool has been uh, already integrated with uh, one of the main tools that people use to um, fix sentences needed in citation, which is Citation Hunt. And so basically, Citation Hunt would surface sentences tagged as citation needed and ask people to fix the citation needed tags. Now Citation Hunt will also have these uh, sentences which are automatically uh, tagged as citation needed in some way. And also the, one of the main research application of the citation detective is that, that we can finally quantify citation quality at scale, given the fact that we can now apply this machine learning model to large number of articles. And so Aiko actually is, uh, is doing her master thesis on this now. 
and uh, basically uh, by being able to um, compute for each article a citation quality score based on how well sourced the sentences are. So the proportion of sentences that are sourced versus the number of sentences needed in citations. Um, and so um, initial results show that basically when we look at citation quality broken down by topic, we found that among the uh, most well-sourced um, articles, we have articles in biography, in biology and medicine. And especially biography is very important because we know that the resolution for biographies of living people puts a special attention on citation quality for these biographies. So um, Aiko will be available in her poster session. Please ask her anything she is uh, going to, uh, she will be happy to reply to your question and you might get the actual presentation later on in the fun session. Sorry for not being able to uh, replace her uh, as well. Um, okay, and the last presentation of this live and talk session will be from Marie. Uh, and Marie, are you there? Yes, hello yeah. everyone, I am Marie. Uh, a PhD student in AVIS team at INRIA working on visualization for linked data. Uh, Jean-Daniel Fekete is the head of the team and my advisor. So the problem we target here is that data producers, you know, um, could you go to the next slide, please, Marianne? Uh, so data producers, in order to increase the quality and ensure the best level of completeness for their data, they need to diagnose when an information is missing for good reasons, like a person has no date of death because she is still alive, when it can be fetched from an external source, or when it can be fixed, like there could be a bug in the mapping process and all dates of death for, let's say, French persons would have disappeared from the data. So we posit that considering entities in small groups based on the information that is missing can help identify those reasons. Our tool, The Missing Path, performs an analysis of the data to populate a vector for each entity with Boolean values indicating if a path exists or not. Then we project the vectors into a map. We can go to the next slide. Um, so let me now describe the interface from the point of view of a Wikidata contributor who wants to curate entities belonging to the class comics. She opens the tool and sees the map in step one. As she moves her mouse, a cluster is highlighted for which many pieces of information that are important to describe comics are missing, such as language, country of origin, publisher, publication, date, and genre. She decides to inspect this group in more details. In the histogram in step two, some paths are colored in pink, indicating that their summary might be significant. One of them is RDFS label. She notices that out of 22 labels, 21 are in French. Another is schema description. Its summary shows that out of 22 descriptions, 21 are in Dutch. A value is repeated 20 times. Strip Feral von Robedus in Babernotes. Comic strips, Piru and Fantasio in Dutch. 20 of those entities are part of the same series. So this group of entities appears to have very similar needs. According to a quality standard, labels and descriptions should be available in similar languages and not labels in French only and descriptions in Dutch only, as, in, as it is the case. From what she knows, Spiro and Fantasio comics are known enough so that it should be easy to find also language publisher and publication date. It is probable that the information will be available from the same source, at least for some of the entities, and this source might even be the URI of the, of the series from which all entities are, pa are part. So it really sounds like she will save time by fixing those entities all at once. So I will have to skip all the details about refining and checking your selection before she clicks the export button. But um, I will finish by saying that the interface as described in this use case is the result of an iterative design process we conducted with nine Wikidata contributors and the user study will soon be related in a full paper. Uh, I will be happy to answer questions during the poster session in the modeling and embedding chat room uh, or by email. Our emails are on the first page of the slide. And I would like to thank the organizers and reviewers. That's all.
Okay, I am not muted anymore. Thank you very much, Marie. Thank you very much, all the seven of you, and that's, that made it to the Light and Talk. Uh, that brings us to the end of the contribution.